What's going on, Dolphins? It is your boy Dylan, and of course, it is Monday, so that means I am doing my post game analysis video for you. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, I, you know, I rewatched the game, talk on my notes, got that stuff down. So I'm ready to go. Obviously, I'm going to give you injury reports and actives. I'm going to give you all the, the stats from the game. Um, and then, you know, the, the four points, right? Did we win? Obviously, yes, we won. How competitive were we? Um, you know, which I'll get into in, in uh, most detail once I get to my, you know, the analysis and the, the specific points from the game. Bright spots. There were a lot of perceived bright spots in this game. The reason why I say perceived, uh, every situation is different, so I'm gonna explain that further as I uh, go through the stats and everything for the individual players, tell you why they were a bright spot, but why, um, you know, it's perceived, right? Because there were certainly a lot of bright spots in this game, but there are some negating factors or, or balancing factors there that, that um, negating factors that kind of balance it out. Um, and then obviously injuries as well. We had a few injuries, so we'll talk about that. So first of all, and then we'll also talk about, you know, draft order at the very end. So for the injuries, the injury report, the Dolphins have a good chance of having every player on the active roster available against the Cincinnati Bengals on Sunday, which they did. All 53 players practiced for a third consecutive day Friday, although five were listed as questionable on the final injury report of the week. The five are guard Evan Bohm with an ankle, defensive end Taco Charlton with an ankle, fullback Chan Cox with a shoulder, kicker Jason Sanders with an illness, uh, and defensive tackle Zach Seiler with an ankle. Bohm and Charlton appeared on the injury report for the first time Friday, and both were lim uh, listed as limited par uh, participants in practice. Sanders and Seiler also were limited Friday, while Cox was a uh, full participant. The other nine players on the injury report this week did not get game status designations and will be available. Linebacker Vince Beagle, quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick, tight end Mike Kosicki, wide receiver Alan Hearns, center Daniel Kilgore, running back Patrick Laird, cornerback Nick Needham, wide receiver Devontae Parker, and wide receiver Albert Wilson. The Bengals ruled out two players Friday, including perennial Pro Bowl wide receiver A.J. Green, who hasn't played all game a game all season because of an ankle injury. Also ruled out was guard John Miller, who has a concussion. They were the only two Cincinnati Bengals to get game status designations. And so for the inactives... We had, um, so real quick, before I actually say about the inactives, let me just preface, and I'll get to the details in a minute, but there is a lot in this game that showed that the Dolphins should have won this game in regulation with, you know, uh, like a 16-point lead, and there's a lot of information and a lot of data points to suggest that the coaching staff did almost everything in their power to lose this game. Um... Again, I'll get to the um, some of the specifics in a bit. One of them, though, was having Raekwon McMillan put on injured reserve now, right? Because, again, he wasn't on recent injury reports, but he has apparently been dealing with this hamstring injury that, put him on, that got him on injured reserve for a while now. But they've been playing him. And so one of their excuses was, well, we didn't want to, you know, in these last few games where it doesn't really matter, you know, we don't want to risk uh, injuring him more. Okay, well, if that was the case, you could have done it last week or the week before when the games, you know, didn't matter so much. What they mean is, is they didn't matter for, you know, playoffs or, you know, anything like that because they don't, right? The only thing that they mattered for is draft positioning, but they're apparently not tanking according to what they say. Right, so, and this is certainly a game that we could have used in because our run defense has been absolutely garbage the entire season. Did it end up being consequential? Um, not necessarily. We did, uh, the Bengals were just inept on the ground, but, you know, that also has, uh, is partly to do on them. They had a ton of penalties. You know, Joe Mixon is dealing with some um, nagging injuries of his own, you know, and they're just not a very good football team. So that plays into it. That's part of the context as well. But And so they were not able to run against us. But having McMillan in there would have helped to uh, guarantee it. But they decided that before this game, one of the, the last winnable game that we had on, this, on the schedule, they decided to put him on injured reserve. To me, the timing was very questionable. Then they have, these are our inactives. Fullback Chandler Cox, okay, Tackle Jamarcus Webb, center guard Keaton Sutherland, center guard Evan Bohm, defensive end Charles Harris and Taco Charlton, and defensive end Avery Moss. Okay, so again, 
why these guys on the inactives list? So Chandler Cox, you might say he did have an injury, but he was a full participant in practice the entire uh, uh, week. And none of the guys really had, um, you know, or none of the guys had uh, game status designations. So we absolutely could have played. And then later on, which I'll get to a little bit more, Christian Wilkins or the coaching staff got like credit, positive credit for using Christian Wilk Wilkins in a unique way, using him at fullback, and he got a touchdown. That was cool and it was fun, but you had a fullback that you could have used, an actual fullback. And they praised them for using him at fullback um, when he's been, you know, underwhelming as a defensive tackle. Right, and he got a sack or like a half sack in this game to be fair i'll talk about that more obviously in a minute but maybe you need to figure out how to get the most out of him at his natural defensive tackle position before trying to you know utilize him on the offense as a fullback especially when you actually have one and the fullback is one of your draft picks right and he's been like mia the entire season but why why right and then three guys on the offensive line, Jamarcus Webb, to be fair, he's been garbage. Keaton Sutherland, he's just a nobody. Evan Bohm, right? He um, practiced uh, part of the week, didn't have a game status designation, and your offense has been pretty bad the entire year. So not having guys available on the offensive line at the very least, you know, is is questionable. Why, like, why, why do you, did they decide that half of the the uh inactives are offensive line and half of them are defensive line when those are the two weakest position groups on your entire team offensive and defensive line defensive line did it end up mattering at the end of the day that charles harris and taco charlton were out even though they practiced a good portion of the week and so and we have no pass rush almost ever at the end of the day we won so it's not everything, but it certainly, you know, played a, a part into why they were able to keep it so close at the end. And Avery Moss, right? Again, and we, we did hold them to a relatively low amount of yards, but that's partly on them as well. They're just not a very good football team. Mixon's dealing with injuries, blah, 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 right? Um, but so, you know, going into this game, there was that, right? And those things alone, you might be able to brush off, okay, maybe they really do need to put McMillan on injured reserve and, you know, preserve him, whatever. Maybe, um, you know, those other guys, three guys on the defensive line, including some of your top pass rushers, three guys on your offensive line, a unit that's been trashed the entire season, right? And then, you get credit for using a defensive tackle at fullback when you had a fullback that could have played. You could have just used the fullback instead of having to, like, having to use a defensive lineman at fullback because you don't have one or because you need one for that play or what have you, right? Not to mention, it didn't, this didn't matter either, but on the play, Christian Wilkins fumbled the ball. Now he had already crossed the goal line, so again, it didn't matter, but he fumbled the ball. Now maybe Chandler Cox would Chandler Cox would have fumbled the ball, but you know I'm guessing probably not because he's actually, while fullbacks don't typically get a lot of receptions, they're they actually do like passing drills and stuff like that because they can sometimes, right? So and I'm I'm pretty sure that generally speaking a fullback's going to have better hands and ball security than a defensive tackle, right? So all that's questionable, but okay, sure you can leave that aside. So now let's actually start getting into. And to be fair, I will give the coaching staff some positive credit in this uh, evaluation as well, but there's a lot more negative uh, that they deserve to be held accountable for. But let's go ahead and get into the actual stats of this game. So the Dolphins obviously ended up winning. We are now 4-11 and on the season. Um, obviously, our next game is against the Patriots in Foxborough. Now, they actually do have something to play for, the number two seed. Um, I find it, even if they put backups in, I find it hard to believe, almost unimaginable, that the Dolphins could end up coming away with a win against the Patriots in Foxborough, even against backups. But you never know, right? And so maybe they decide to sit some guys. Um, but I, knowing, like, Bill Belichick, I mean, I don't know him personally, but having watched him for all this long, uh, this all this time, whatever... I'm guessing that they're going to play their starters because they still have the number two seed to fight for, okay? And so, 
you know, they're going to want that buy. The playoffs are already going through Baltimore, so that's already tough enough. But getting that number two seed and having the the second of the two bye weeks in the um, uh, wild card round is huge, right? So that might be worth not sitting some players this week. Although they could also sit players, still beat us, and then have like a mini buy for their starters. So we'll just have to wait and see how that goes. Regardless, I find it unimaginable, almost nearly unimaginable that we can come away with a win. But if we did, obviously that could potentially drop our draft positioning a little more. But I think it's more likely that we'll end up getting our 12th loss on the season. Either way, 4 and 12, 5 and 11 is obviously not a good record um, overall. Certainly more wins than I thought we were going to get at the beginning of the season. But I attribute that, of course, to the players and how hard they've played. Certainly not the coaching staff because there is over or the front office because there is overwhelming evidence to suggest that or to not just suggest but to prove that both the front office and coaching staff had uh hands in and deliberately designed this team to be bad right off the rip right and then there's plenty of evidence to prove that the coaching staff has thrown games like the um washington redskins game uh the uh giants game last week the steelers game okay so, and all of that has ramifications on our draft positioning. All of those games had ramifications on our draft positioning, okay? And so, uh, and then in this game, which obviously we'll get to, but we win. So the Bengals secure the number one spot overall um, with a record of one and 14. So they are locked in as that number one spot. So there's definitely, so depending on how this next week goes, we could potentially somehow maybe get the, um, you know, number two spot that obviously would require a loss, which is most likely, but it also requires some other things to happen. Um, you know, with the other teams that are ahead of us, like, I think the Cowboys would need to like, I, I beat the, I think the, I think the Eagles play the Washington Redskins and the Cowboys play the Giants or maybe the other way around either way both of those teams would need uh you know to win they would need to the the Washington Redskins and the Giants would have to win and we would have to lose for us to be able to move up to like the number two spot right and the 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 Lions would have to win as well right um but those teams are also likely to lose just like we are now, we could also, if we were to win against the Patriots, we could potentially fall to the number six spot. As of right now, we are picking with our pick at number five. Anyway, we'll get into that, obviously, more once the week, next week's over, and we actually just know how the game's played out. Um, I'm not really going to speculate about that too much, but those are possibilities, okay? So, but the Bengals do for sure have the number one spot, the number one pick. We won 38 to 35, ended up being a really high scoring game. I certainly wouldn't have thought that. Um, so it was exciting in that way. It was definitely exciting that and awesome that we got the win. Obviously, as you guys know, that's all I care about. I care about wins and having a consistently good team and building the team right. Uh, again, I completely disagree with the tanking philosophy and the Browns are, are you know, a, the only example that anybody uses and they're imploding. Their, their head coach might not be there for much longer. OBJ was, you know, seen throwing his helmet and screaming at Freddie Kitchens on the sideline in this past game when they lost. Their record's not very great. They got all this talent and so on and so forth, but they're going to end up having cap issues. Jarvis Landry and OBJ want out. So there's, there's... There's way too much that can go wrong, wrong, and there's already a lot that has gone wrong. Chase Young's not even going to be coming out in this upcoming draft. Tua had his injury. So the Dolphins' plans are constantly changing. There's going to be a ton of roster turnover next year. It's still going to be a very young and inexperienced team. Their first draft has been underwhelming to say the least. Right, So there's a lot that goes into it, and I personally don't agree with it or believe that it's going to work. They, again, they still have a chance to prove me wrong, but we'll see. So getting into these stats, we had 502 total yards. All right, so the offense had some good production. But again, let's also remember that while the offense has been, you know, 
slowly like kind of getting better over the second half of the season sort of um we've also played a bunch of not very good teams or bad teams the giants and the Bengals, the jets and blah 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 right so although the jets did squeak out a win over the steelers but they're also having some pretty bad quarterback issues anyway so i'll talk more about some of the other games in a minute so we had 502 total total yards they had 430. we had 406 passing yards they had 371. we had 96 rushing yards and they had 59. we were at 4.7 yards per play they had four uh i'm sorry we had 5.7 yards per play i think i said four and they had 5.1 yards per play uh they had a fumble and we had an interception so we were even in the turnover uh differential there it was dead even we are, were 37% on third down. They were 22%. We had the ball for 36 minutes, 24 seconds, 33 minutes and 36 seconds for them. Obviously, that's because we were in overtime. We had six penalties. They had 10, um, but those were accepted penalties. Both teams had more penalties than were just accepted. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, they're a bad team. You know, they couldn't even run on our our terrible run defense with uh, Raekwon McMillan out. They had a bunch of penalties. Obviously, they didn't convert shit on third down. Andy Dalton was super uh, inaccurate. There was a lot of things that they did wrong that helped to contribute to this. But this coaching staff gave them undue chances. We'll get to that in a minute. Ryan Fitzpatrick was 31 of 52 for 59.6% of, uh, of, of his passes for 419 yards, four touchdowns, one interception, and a 103 passer rating. So Ryan Fitzpatrick has been kind of a bright spot he's still obviously not going to be the future of this franchise he could potentially be here next year um i mean we'll have to see i don't imagine they're going to have three quarterbacks it's almost unimaginable that they're not going to take one in the first round of this year uh this year's draft so if that's the case it's hard to th hard to see them have rosen the uh new draft first round draft pick and fitzpatrick um, and it looks like Rosen could be the, the guy that they cut bait with, which would obviously make this this year's draft, the 2019 draft, uh, worse. And their Italian of, talent evaluation, uh, another black mark on that record. But, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick has been a little, he's made it a little bit more fun and certainly has, you know, helped to contribute to some of these wins. Like he, the Redskins game, he brought us back and we could have just legitimately won that game if the coaching staff didn't fuck it away with stupid play calling, misuse of personnel, and the decision to go for two um, instead of take it to overtime when you would have had a much better probability of winning in overtime based on how the game played out and how, you know, the teams were performing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he has been fun to watch. And certainly I do think that he's part of the reason why the rest of the players are playing hard, not the coaching staff. I think it's because, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick is a good leader. Uh, let's see. Andy Dalton was... Goodness gracious. Andy Dalton was 33 of 56 for 58.9% uh, completion percentage for 396 yards, four touchdowns, and a 104 and a half passer rating. Miles Gaskin led the way for us with 16 rushes, 55 yards, one touchdown, and a 3-4 average. But so and so Miles Gaskin had the best game so far um, of his career, but he got a lot of that yardage um towards the very end of the game late in the third and in the fourth quarter prior to that and here's one of the the other data points that shows uh, i believe that the coaching staff tried to put this team in bad position if they really wanted to win as is that on the first drive patrick laird had some good plays some positive yardage some really nice plays good effort like he has shown uh, good some solid production and then on even on the first drive they pulled him after that he didn't resurface until like late in the third quarter and then came out again like for one or two play or came back in for like one or two plays in like maybe the fourth or in, in overtime right so they didn't use him like hardly at all even though like the few times that he did i mean he was eight for 17 yards in a 2.1 average right so obviously those stats aren't that great he did have a couple plays um that were you know short games or you know at the line of scrimmage but 
he showed like he was going to have solid production in that first drive. They pull him out. Miles Gaskin and Delance Turner don't do much of anything. They put him back in. He has another like, you know, no gainer or like short gainer and then pops off another good run. And then they pull him out again. Miles Gaskin and Delance Turner go back in. Delance Turner didn't do anything. Miles Gaskin starts to pick it up a little bit, like I said, in the third. So their use of running backs yet again has been just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so that's part of the frustration, right? And part of the the mounting evidence. But there's even more specific stuff that I'll get into in a little bit. I want to move through these statistics. And, you know, I'll talk about that more once I actually get to the analysis. Joe Mixon, I know this has all been analysis, but I'm just saying. Uh, you'll see. Anyway, Joe Mixon was 21 for 50 yards, 21 carries for 51, 50 yards and a 2.4 average. Devontae Parker, uh, definitely a bright spot on this team, this game, and in the entire season. He was 5 out of 15, so he was targeted a lot, only caught a third of his his passes, which isn't very good, but he did have 111 yards and a touchdown. Mike Kosicki was 6 of 12. He's another bright spot. Um, but so real quick, in, in the case of Parker, now he broke 1,000 yards. He's got nine touchdowns on the season. He's got more catches, so he's obviously had a career year, and he's had a few games with over 100 yards. He's dominated in a couple of them, okay? Um, you know, he's living up to his potential of being able to high point the ball and go and get those 50, 50 balls, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, everybody's trying to give Brian Flores and this coaching staff, like all the credit. Do they get maybe a little bit of credit for helping to continue to develop it, to develop him? Yes. But Devonte Parker's biggest issue was never his ability, right? It was his availability, right? Being on the field because he was always hurt. Now, it was Adam Gase who gets the most credit, as, it, as weird as it might seem, for his breakout season. Why? Because they were the ones that got him to finally eat right and sleep right and, and practice right. And it was because of guys that they brought in like Danny Amendola and Frank Gore. And obviously Cam Wake was still here at the time. So he had guys like that to help mentor him as well. Okay? And so... It was the, the Adam Gase regime that got Devontae Parker to finally do things the right way to where he could finally actually be on the field to produce at the level that we always knew he could. Mike Kosicki, okay? He's having a breakout year as well, right? It's only a second season, right? But how he got here is a couple things. One, we're kind of forced to throw the ball because we have no run game. So, and we also almost have no receivers. So he's getting targeted a lot, especially since Ryan Fitzpatrick knows he's a 50-50 ball kind of guy as well. So him and Devontae Parker, he just kind of throws it up to him, right? And he's gotten lucky uh, to some degree because they are those kind of guys and have that ability and have come down with the passes. But also, um, last year, he was a rookie, so obviously it takes some time to, to work in as a tight end. Tight end is a tough position to break in the NFL. But the biggest thing is, is he had to learn how to block better. And that is a credit to Adam Gase's regime. Not to mention he is also an Adam Gase pick. Okay, and they picked him to do exactly this. So again, we never disputed uh, to this point. It hasn't been a dispute about his ability. It's just more. And last year they needed him to block more which was great though for him because he became a better blocker but they needed it was also part out of a uh, part of necessity because the offensive line got ravaged by injuries okay but but Gesicki is a much better blocker now because of the Adam Gase regime and he was a pick of theirs <clears throat> Albert Wilson was 7 to 7 for 79 yards I don't know if he's going to end up being in Miami for much longer. We'll have to see what ends up happening. But, you know, that was a guy that was brought in by Gase. He's had, you know, some solid production for us this year. Isaiah Ford was 5 of 6, 68 yards. That was a guy drafted by Gase. Uh, Alan Hearns was 2 of 2 for 41. That was a guy brought in by this regime and signed to a, um, a new contract this year. But he's just been okay, right? Durham Smythe. He's been all right. He's obviously more of a blocking tight end and, and is used more that way. He was 2 of 2 for 18, but that was also a gay, gay pick. Clive Walford, he's been on and off the roster this year. Had 1 of 2 for 15 yards. Um, and he's been, you know, 
overall a disappointment, but that was a guy brought in by this coaching staff. And Christian Wilkins was one of one, one yard and a touchdown. Like I said, they could have just used the fullback that they have on the roster. That's what they drafted him for. I don't know. Apparently they don't trust him enough or something, but it doesn't really help your, your first draft class and your overall evaluation of them. And, you know, again, Christian Wilkins fumbled the ball. It didn't matter because he did cross, to be fair, he did cross the goal line, but still, that wouldn't have even been a scare if, I, at least I would presume it wouldn't have been a scare if it was the fullback catching the ball as opposed to a defensive tackle. And again, Christian Wilkins, even though he got like a half sack or a sack in this game and maybe a tackle for loss as well, I think I'll get to that in a minute, but he's been very much underwhelming as well, especially for your first round pick, right? Now, again, to be fair, um, you know, especially with this draft class, it is only their first year. And so you can't fully evaluate them until at least they've completed their, their rookie uh, contracts. However, when you um, evaluate the this rookie class on its first year, just on its first year, it's very underwhelming. Tyler Boyd led the way for them, 9 out of 15 for 128 yards and two touchdowns. John Ross was 6 of 13 for 84 yards. Tyler Eifert was 4 of 8 for 57 yards and a touchdown. Alex Erickson was 6 of 9 for 55 yards. CJ Uzoma was 4 of 4, 37 yards and a touchdown. Joe Mixon, 2 of 2 for 23 yards. And Giovanni Bernard had two catches on three targets for 12 yards. Uh, fumbles, Christian Wilkins had one, didn't lose it. That's the fumble I was talking about before. Andy Dalton had and lost a fumble. Defensively, Jerome Baker led the way for us. Seven uh, solo tackles, five assisted, a half sack and a tackle for loss with a pass defense. Um, Calvin Munson had four solo tackles. Trent Harris, four solo tackles, one assisted uh, and a sack and a forced fumble. And so look, in this game, Trent Harris was a bright spot, but where the hell has he been the entire time? Right, so like in his case, he's maybe an okay guy at best, uh, but he hasn't done anything up to this point. So he had like a breakout game, but we need guys that are going to be consistent, guys that can be potentially long-term uh, pieces on this roster. But maybe he will, maybe he won't. There's going to be a lot of roster turnover next year, so maybe he stays, maybe he doesn't. Zach Seiler had a pretty damn good game for us, but we just picked him up like you know, a few days before this game. And, you know, again, we were playing a bad Bengals team. So that obviously has, has something to do with it as well. The, uh, you know, and that they couldn't run on our, our bad de uh, run defense, but he had three solo and four assisted tackles, one sack and a tackle for loss with two passes defense. Right. So, um, you know, is he, can he be consistent like that? Is he going to be part of the long-term future? You know, we'll see. Devon Godshaw, he has been a consistent bright spot, but that again is another Adam Gase pick. He had three solo, three assisted tackles and a half sack. He's definitely one of our best defensive linemen, but again, that was an Adam Gase pick and he, and he, he uh, performed well for us during his time in the Adam Gase regime. Nick Needham, he's been a consistent bright spot right for this team he had three solo tackles with one assisted in a pass defense but he also got beat for a bad touchdown got beat pretty bad for a touchdown to tyler boyd i think it was his first one and um you know whiffed on the tackle had, you know got fooled in on the route he lost you know uh distance on his coverage and then you know missed the tackle and boyd got in and he also had uh one penalty uh i think just one penalty but he also had a and he's had several penalties over the season right so he's up and down and he's just kind of an average guy at best but he has been the one of the most consistent defensive backs we've had so full context there and to be fair nate brooks was three solo one assisted and a pass defense uh eric rowe three solo with a pass uh three solo and one assisted he did have an interception that got taken off the board because of a holding penalty on him so eric rowe had an interception but it got wiped out by his own holding penalty right but he got a contract extension just again another average guy uh adrian colbert uh colbert two solo two assisted in a pass defense tay hayes two solo one assisted in a pass defense andrew van ginkle two solo tackles a tackle for loss and a forced fumble so like that's his best game but again, you know, one of your draft picks was on injured reserve half the year and had, that's like that and a couple special teams tackles is all he's contributed, right? So 
you know, again, I mean, to me, when I look at all of this information, there are some bright spots, but in the, it's in the context of a team that is nothing but undrafted guys, waiver wires, backups, practice squad guys, guys off the street, you know, on a team that was designed to be low talent and is low talent, low leadership, low proven production, um, right? All of that stuff. And they've played, you know, several bad teams and stuff as well. So in the context, to me, the and especially to, you know, with the the ex expectation that there's also going to be a ton of roster turnover, the lackluster first uh, draft under this regime. There's so much information that to me doesn't give me much confidence in their ability to get it right going forward. There was, you know, more reports that the Dolphins are going to be big spenders in free agency. I think that's a terrible idea. You know, there's still potential that they could even trade up in the draft to get a quarterback. I mean, if we end up at fifth or sixth, with, you know, the Steelers pick being in the late teens and the Texans pick being in like the early to mid 20s, we could trade away some of our draft capital to go up and get Joe Burrow. I mean, I think it's more likely that the Bengals are going to, but what if they trade up to number two to take, you know, Justin Herbert or Fromm or, you know, Love or one of those other guys? I think that would be a terrible idea. Um, anyway, so obviously we'll have to wait and see how that goes, but you know, there is still potential for that as well. And I think, you know, I personally don't have faith or trust in them to get this right going forward. Again, they can prove me wrong. We'll have to wait and see in a few months when the draft comes around. Jermaine Pratt led the way for them. 10 solo, one assisted tackle, two tackles for loss. Sean Williams, eight solo, five assisted, one sack, one tackle for loss. Darquez Denard, six solo, two assisted tackles. Uh, BD or BW Webb. Five solo, two assisted. Sam Hubbard, four solo, two assisted, a sack and a tackle for loss. Carlos Dunlap, four solo tackles and a pass defense. Jesse Bates, three solo, two assisted, a forced fumble and a pass defense. Nick Vigil, two solo, two assisted, a pass defense. Darius Phillips, one solo, one interception, three passes defense. And Greg Maven with a pass defense. Jason Sanders was one for two on his field goals. Um... That missed field goal also could have, you know, won us the game a little sooner, but we should have honestly just won the game in the fourth quarter at the end of the game in regulation up by like two scores, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. He had a long of 37, five of five on his extra points. Randy Bullock was two of two on his field goals, a long of 57, one of one on his extra points. Matt Hawk had six punts. 49 average, two inside the 20 with a long of 60. Kevin Huber, uh, eight punts, 48 and a half average, three inside the 20, a long of 59. Trevor Davis had one kickoff return for 22 yards. Isaiah Ford had one for six. Darius Phillips had two kickoff returns, an average of 25 yards and a long of 29 for the Bengals. Punt returns, Trevor Davis had four returns, six and a half average, a long of 10. Alex Erickson had three for them, 14.3 average, a long of 17. So now let's get to the, the key points in the analysis, right? So first and foremost, the thing that's most important to me, of course, is did we win? Yes, we won the game. Now, were we competitive? That's the number two thing, right? And so this is where, you know, the, the specific plays, you know, that are notable and stuff comes out. This is where the meat of the analysis is, right? So overall, yes. I think we were competitive, but again, it was a bad team. They couldn't even run on our terrible defense with Raekwon McMillan out. Um, you know, they were penalized a ton, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Andy Dalton was not good. Mixon is dealing with some, you know, injury issues. You know, they got hurt in this game. They lost some guys as well. Um, you know, so there's a lot that goes into it. And so overall, we were, and, and certainly our players are definitely playing hard. Um, so overall. Uh, yes, we were competitive. Obviously, they're a bad team as well. The players definitely play hard, like I said. Start, um, and then, you know, I talked about the, the use of Patrick Laird and the running backs. It's just mind-boggling, and every time Patrick Laird seems to do good things, they, they pull him out. And then even at one point, Miles Gaskin started doing some good things, and then they went to DeLance Turner. So, you know, normally the philosophy is if you really want to win, when you have a guy that has a hot hand or doing good things, you stick with him and give him more opportunities to see if he can keep producing it. And then if he doesn't, maybe you switch it up. But that's not how they do it. It's like every time Patrick Laird or even when Miles Gaskin did some good things, they would switch it up and go with somebody else. 
and they they kept going down the list. When Patrick Laird did good things, they took him out and put Miles Gaskin and Delance Turner in. Finally, when um, Gaskin started doing things, uh, some good things, they took him out and put Delance Turner in, who didn't do anything at all. So, like, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, so let's get to at some of the actual specific plays of things that were notable to me. And like I said, there's going to be a couple things in here in which I give the coaching staff some positive credit, but most of it is not good. So first, the Dolphins were on the Bengals' one-yard line, okay? It was second and goal with eight minutes and 41 seconds left to go in the first quarter. This was Christian Wilkins' uh, Christian Wilkins' touchdown, where he was used as a fullback and caught the one-yard pass, touchdown, Dolphins go up 7-0. to zero. So some positive credit because I do think you know it was it was fun it was exciting it was cool Christian Wilkins gets a touchdown but again he ended up fumbling you have a fullback on the roster right you could have just used him instead of having him inactive to start the game right so with Raekwon McMillan and you know the inactives that we chose I believe that that was you know handicapping us going into the game and then so you get some credit you can get some partial credit for you know being creative and using him there but you have a fullback and he probably wouldn't have had the the fumble scare if you would have used him instead okay he was a full participant in practice okay he's got an uh, I think it was an ankle injury or something but he was a full participant didn't have a game status designation you absolutely could have used him in this game you didn't have to use Christian Wilkins and at his natural position, defensive tackle, he's been underwhelming, and he's your first-round pick. So you should probably focus on getting him to be good at his natural position, the one you took him for, the one you took him in the first round for, okay? Uh, next, we have the Dolphins on the Dolphins' own 42nd or 42-yard line. It was first and 10 with 6 minutes and 2 seconds left to go in the first quarter. Um, and so there's... Some really good credit here to the to the coaching staff, and then some immediate bad uh, credit to go after it. So there was a beautiful, it was a beautiful play design. It was a little little flea flicker. It wasn't anything particularly spectacular in the sense that you know people have seen flea flickers before, right? But it was beautiful and it was well executed by the players. It was a flea flicker. Uh, Fitzpatrick hands it off to Laird. Laird pitches it back to Fitzpatrick. He throws the ball downfield to Devontae Parker. 51 yards, right? So we were on our own 42-yard line. It's a 51-yard gain. Parker tracks it, makes a good adjustment, gets the ball, got some a little bit of separation from the defensive back. It's a 51-yard gain to Devontae Parker. And on that play, he crossed over the 1,000-yard mark on the season. So wonderful in a lot of ways, right? Took us down to the Bengals' 7-yard line. And then Flores calls a timeout. Why? Why? Why did you need to call a timeout? You have all that momentum. You just had a, a great play, beautiful design, beautiful execu execution. It's a 51-yard gainer. No, just get back to the line and go. Don't give them 30 seconds to breathe and to get you know a defensive scheme up that they want to. We just got down to the set seven yard line. No, you you keep pushing. You keep the 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 gas pedal down. There's no reason, absolutely no reason whatsoever to call a timeout in that situation. Now, did it end up mattering on that drive? No, we ended up getting a touchdown, 14 to zero at that point. Dolphins up, but it just it, there's no reason. It's nonsensical. And had they somehow managed to you know stop us and like hold us to a field goal or get a turnover then it would have been a massive disaster massive disaster and there's just like i said there's just no reason for it whatsoever right and the thing you do if you really want to show good and smart aggressiveness or whatever and if you really want to show an attitude that is conducive towards winning you just get after that big gainer that huge uh, momentum booster you just get up there you run another play and you try and just ram it down their throats immediately instead of giving them a breather and a chance to you know come up with a, a good defensive play for for whatever right it's absolutely ridiculous okay then we move on the Bengals had the ball on the Dolphins 34 yard line okay uh, Bengals ball on Dolphins 34 it was first and 10 with seven seconds left in the first half 
okay? The Bengals kick a field goal from 52 yards out. So it was a 52 yard attempt, okay? They missed the field goal, right? It was a missed kick. At this point, it's 21 to three, okay? Dolphins are leading 21 to three, seven seconds left to go in the half. It's a 52 yard attempt and he missed it. But they got another attempt because Brian Flores called a timeout again. So in this one, I'm gonna half defend him because okay, I get it. You are trying to ice him, but why? What is, what really in this particular situation, it's a long fucking field goal, it's 52 yards. I mean, you know, it makes more sense if it's more of a chip shot or an easier field goal. And you're, you're winning 21 to three at this point with seven seconds left to go in the half. And then he missed it. So it proved that it proved that the that the the timeout ended up being, um, you know, useless, right? The and 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 nonsensical yet again, right? And to be fair, right, on the second attempt, uh, he missed it again. But the Bengals had a false start, pushed him back five more yards. So on the second attempt, it was still a 52 attempt. He missed it again, but they had a false start, pushed him back five yards, and they got a third attempt. So to be fair to Flores, on the second attempt, after you iced him, he missed it again, which kind of saved his, his ass. But then their own mistake fucked us. And then, you know, from 57 yards out, they make it to get uh, the score, you know, then 21 to 6. So, you know, close the gap just a little bit. But with the way that the game turned out, that was huge. It ended up being huge. That three points was massive, right? And then, of course, the Bengals got the ball to start the second half. So now um, we get to late in the game, right? Way late in the game, in the fourth quarter. And this is, this is, the, this is the series of events that really put it over the top. You know, the... Raekwon McMillan thing, the inactives, the misuse, uh, the mysterious use of the running backs, and then these previous uh, plays that I just talked about paled in comparison to then what happened at the very end of the game, right? So Bengals have the ball on the Dolphins' three-yard line. It's third and goal with 36 seconds left in the game, okay? At this point, the Dolphins are winning winning the game 35 to 19 okay 35 to 19 30 seconds left to go in the game it's third and goal Bengals have the ball on our three yard line the Bengals throw an incomplete pass from dalton to boyd right so now it's going to be fourth down with 33 seconds left to, to go in the game flores calls a fucking timeout Again, with the fucking timeouts, giving them more of an opportunity, more of a breather, more of time to think about what they want to do than they should have been given. Why would you call a timeout? It was one of the last two that we had. We were up 35 to 19. It's now going to be fourth down. Don't give them that fucking breather to fucking recalibrate. Because then on fourth down, fourth and goal with 33 seconds left to go, the Bengals throw a fucking touchdown from Dalton to Boyd, making the game 35 to 25, right? Dolphins winning still, but they close the gap. Then they go for a two point conversion, which they, they make, okay? Making it 35 to 27. So they close the gap, they get the touchdown and the two point conversion. Then the Bengals kick the onside kick and they recover it with 29 seconds left in the game. Right, so our our hands team was unable uh, to recover it. It was a good kick by the Bengals kicker. It went the ten yards, bounced high up over our guys, and their guys went and they got it. Okay, twenty nine fucking seconds left in the game. They move the ball downfield. Okay, we get to the point where the Bengals are on the Dolphins' twenty five yard line. Second and ten. Okay, second and ten with four seconds left to go in the game four seconds left to go okay they're on the dolphin they're on the dolphins 25 yard line so there's 25 yards to go so there's a good amount of space okay this play ended up being very similar 
uh, to the play, the third and 20 play, that was 40 some odd yards out from the end zone against the Steelers. The Dolphins played a prevent defense, okay? There was tons of open space in the middle of the field. Now, what Andy Dalton should have done was uh, a little bit different than what he actually did do. Now, with all that space, they could have done the exact same thing that the Pittsburgh Steelers did to us on the third and 20 play for, uh, that was 40 yards away from the end zone where we played a prevent defense. They throw the ball. Um, you know, it was in that case in the Steelers game, it was past the first down, but like 10 yards short of the goal line. They throw it to one of their, you know, uh, fastest, most elusive receivers, whatever, short of the goal line, but past the first down marker. Okay, since we're playing a prevent defense, easy completion because there's no defenders there, and then get some blocks and they go into the fucking end zone. That's what should have happened in this case with Andy Dalton, but he waited too long. We only had three guys rushing. We had everybody in the end zone. The field was wide open, plenty of space. They could have, they pretty easily, so if, you know, Andy Dalton could have made this easier on himself and on his team than what he made it, right? He could have got it to one of his, um, you know, faster, more elusive receivers. There were definitely blocks to be had by the other like four receivers that were on the field and all of our guys were in the end zone. They could have thrown it just short of the end zone a little bit, like, you know, four or five yards short of the end zone and got some blocks and got the touchdown. But Andy Dalton made it a little bit easier or a little bit harder on them and essentially turned it into a Hail Mary, which made the defensive call potentially be a little bit better, right? Because then all the receivers get into the end zone. They kind of throw, he kind of throws it up like a Hail Mary, but Tyler Eifert still comes down with it. So even though that prevent defense was there, I mean, it, it should, you know, it was a bad call because again, the Bengals could have easily, more easily gotten a touchdown doing what the Steelers did, but they still end up getting it anyway. I'm sorry, that was a long drawn out way of, of explaining it, but I wanted to make sure I was super specific. So they end up getting, so I disagree with the play call. They should have had at least some guys, one or two guys. If you want to rush three, okay, but at least keep like, you know, um, one or two guys in the middle of the field just in case they do the short, the, you know, the, uh, the throw that's, you know, four or five yards short of the goal line, right, with blocks ahead of them. So that way you could still possibly uh, prevent that from being an option. But they didn't. The prevent defense made that an option. Andy Dalton didn't take it and waited too long and essentially turned it into a Hail Mary. But then they had that become successful, right? The Hail Mary was successful. So the Dolphins are now leading 35 to 33. They're within a two point conversion away, right? So Dalton waited too long. Hail Mary should have thrown it short, blah, blah, blah. Um, they still get the touchdown. And then again, Flores calls a fucking timeout. Our last timeout of the fucking game. There is literally zero seconds on the fucking clock because remember that second and 10 play, it was a second and 10 play, 25 yards out. They play a fucking prevent defense, every, bring three guys, everybody. The difference was, the difference was also one key difference too, let me be clear. In the Steelers game, they just brought the house and left nobody on the back end, right? So they, they had plenty of blockers. To, but in this case, with everybody deep in the end zone, one or two blockers would have been enough for the short pass, uh, or I say short pass, but it would have, it, it would have been, you know, a pass that could have been completed four or five yards of the goal line, and one or two blockers could have been enough for him to get that last four or five yards to get in, right? So the play designs were a bit different but it's the same basic concept. They left the entire middle of the field open to give them a much easier opportunity than they should have had. But anyway, then he calls a fucking, our last time out. So there was four seconds left to go in the game, second and 10, they end up getting the touchdown after what I think is a bad uh, defensive scheme play call. 
and then there's zero seconds left to go on the clock. Obviously, they're gonna, they scored a touchdown, so they have to line up for the two-point conversion. Obviously, they're not going to kick the extra point because then even if they make it, they would lose. So they're obviously going to go for the two, and they have to by rules, right? But why would you call the timeout? Why? Because if you didn't, then they would just have to line up and call a fucking play. They didn't have any timeouts. They were out of timeouts at that point. So there was no way that they would have been able to call a timeout to give themselves a breather. But he gave them a fucking chance. He gave them a fucking, hey man, you know, you guys are winded. This is late in the game. There's zero seconds left on the clock. You got a two-point conversion to tie the game. You need it. It's it's crucial. This is this is everything. And we're going to give you a fucking breather. When you have no timeouts, we're going to call one, our last one. We're going to call our last time, timeout so you can get this right. And then what happens? They convert the fucking two points. Andy Dalton ends up running it in himself. Game tied at 35-35. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Are you fucking kidding? How many chances do you need to give them? Right? We, again, we should have won the game like uh, 35 to 19 or whatever. We should have won the game in regulation. But we didn't because Brian Flores decided to give them, you know, undue chances. Absolutely fucking ridiculous. We go into overtime. Uh, Dolphins have the ball on their own 46 uh, yard line, a fourth and two with 750 left to go in offense uh, in overtime. Um, there was a moment there where I thought that, you know, Brian Flores was going to go for it. To his credit, though, and so this is some more credit that I want to give to them, positive credit. They decided to kick it. I thought that would have been stupid. There's obviously only, uh, what, 10 minutes in, in overtime. There's only one overtime. It was fourth and two. We were on our own 46 yard line. I thought he was going to be overly aggressive and try and go for it and then end up like potentially failing on it and giving them short uh, field or short field to potentially go get the win. But to his credit, they ended up punting it. So I just wanted to, to mention that just to, you know, to be fair and to give them a little bit more credit. And then at the end of the game, the Dolphins have the ball inside the Bengals 20 yard line with two minutes left to go in overtime. So before the game's just done, period. If we didn't score any points, the game would have ended as a tie, okay? They did a conservative run. Ryan Fitzpatrick ends up keeping it. He lost like one or two yards on the run. And then they just knelt, uh, knelt the ball twice, okay? Now, this is more positive credit, right? Because that actually was the right thing to do, right? Just because you had less than two minutes. I mean, that series of plays started you know after the two minute warning but then you have less than two minutes you're conservative you don't do anything overly aggressive so that way you don't have a chance of like getting a turnover you lost like six yards overall but you were already at the entire time you were within the 20 yard line so it's a chip shot field goal you know take a couple chances maybe you know conservative chances maybe you can get a score but if not at least you can take it to fourth down, run out the clock the entire way. That was the point of the of kneeling the ball. Just run the clock all the way down, and then with a couple seconds left, kick the field goal and win the game. So that's some positive credit. But again, it never should have got there. We should have won 35 to 19 in regulation. But throughout this entire game, and even again from my perspective, prior to the game starting with the McMillan to IR and the inactives list, I think that this coaching staff did a lot to put us at a disadvantage and make it hard and you know the use of the running backs uh and make it you know put this team in um a higher probability of having failure lower probability of success and then you know with these decisions on the field they gave the Bengals chances that they shouldn't have had and we almost could have lost this game but then, you know, to their credit, because credit where credit's due, at the very end, I don't know, maybe they thought it would have just been, you know, too over the top in that context to, you know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But, you know, they did the right thing, they did bleed the clock, they kicked the fucking field goal, the chip shot, and... Uh, you know, we did end up winning the game. So some positive credit where credit is due in that regard. But there was a lot in this game that 
made it way closer than it should have been and gave them a chance where they shouldn't have had it. And that is on the coaching staff, 100%. Now, real quick injuries. Jamal Wilkes got injured. Jerome Baker got injured, although he came back in. Didn't seem like it was anything more than maybe like just getting the wind knocked out of him. Vince Beagle left the game, though, and I believe he was carted off. Um, Miles Gaskin left the game. So Jamal Wiltz, Vince Beagle, and Miles Gaskin all looked uh, like they were in significant you know, pain. Some of them didn't return to the game. Vince Beagle and Gaskin didn't return to the game. Uh, I don't think Jamal Wiltz did either, actually. I, I don't remember. But So we did have a few guys get hurt. I mean, you know, from what I've seen today, Miles Gaskin is probably pretty unlikely to play against the Patriots. Um, you know, so obviously in the injury uh, area, we didn't, you know, fare too well. In this game, we had, you know, we did ha uh, had four injuries of some prominent players or whatever. Uh, so, you know, but it is what it is. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, and so real quick to wrap this up, I just want to go ahead and talk a little bit more about the current draft positioning. So right now we currently have the fifth overall pick, the 19th overall pick from the Steelers because they just lost to the Jets. Um, and then the 25th overall pick from the Texans, they have clinched their division and they are absolutely going to the playoffs in one of the top four seeds. Um, so, you know, their pick is going to be mid um tw uh, you know mid 20s for sure um now the Steelers are currently not in the playoffs next week will depend if um you know if the Titans end up losing and the Steelers end up winning which the Titans play the Texans so that game could go either way um you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. But the Steelers play the Ravens. I don't know if the Steelers are going to be able to beat the Ravens. But either way, that would lead... Even if the Steelers lose and they don't make it into the playoffs, then their pick is probably going to be mid-teens. Somewhere in the mid to late teens. Whereas, if they make it into the playoffs, then that pick would go to uh, the early 20s. So we'll have to see how that plays out after next week. Um, for the Steelers to get back in as a wild card, the Titans would have to lose against the Texans, and the Steelers would have to win against the Ram, or I mean the the Ravens. Excuse me. So um, I think it requires both of those things to happen. Maybe just one of them. Either way, it requires some things to happen. Um, for the Steelers to get back in the playoffs, we'll end up having to see what happens there. Um, but yeah, so just some quick notable things. You know, Texans won against the Bucks to secure their spot. Bills lost to the Patriots. Um, and so that's part of the reason why the Patriots have something to play for next week. That number two seed, 49ers beat the Rams. Jets beat the Steelers. So obviously that has implications on the, the draft order. And could potentially make it so that way the Steelers are picking, you know, at best in the mid. Well, obviously we'd be picking, but the Steelers pick could be in the mid uh, teens. Um, Ravens beat the Browns, whatever. Colts beat the Panthers. Falcons beat the Jags. I mean, the Jags could, depending on how things go next week, the Jags could end up uh, jumping us, and that's how we could end up going to the number six pick. But obviously a lot of things have to work out in a certain way for that to happen. Giants beat the Redskins this week, which keeps both of them ahead of us. Um, the Saints did beat the Titans, but I will say the Titans, they only lost because of some bad officiating. Uh, I don't have the exact examples in front of me or whatever, but I did have that game on as well uh, yesterday. And from what I saw, I mean, Tannehill certainly gave them... Um, you know, an opportunity winning that game. Derrick Henry wasn't in. So with him being out, Tannehill really led the charge there and gave them a, a fighting chance, but they were, you know, victimized by some uh, really bad officiating that to me ultimately uh, caused them to lose the game. Raiders beat the Chargers. Broncos beat the Lions, which put the Lions ahead of us in the draft order. And that's why we ended up dropping to fifth after this week. Uh, Eagles beat the Cowboys. Cardinals beat the Seahawks. 
which was interesting. But Kenyon Drake had another big game in that game uh, for them um, to help them, you know, win over the at the time 11 and three Seahawks. Um, Chiefs beat the Bears, whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, after next week, you know, we'll know for sure what the vast majority of the draft order is going to be. We'll have to wait and see how far. But, you know, and real quick on Tennessee, but look, they're currently in the playoffs as it stands this week. We have to wait and see how it goes next week. But Tannehill is the reason why that team is currently in the playoffs and certainly has a chance depending on what happens next week, you know, to secure a playoff spot, right? Um, the reason why the, the Steelers, one major reason why the Steelers are fighting for a playoff spot is because of Minka Fitzpatrick, right? Kenyon Drake's been killing it for the Cardinals. So again, you know, none of this stuff needed to happen. Um, whatever, whatever, whatever. But, you know, next week we'll know how most of this is. Obviously, the Houston pick could... As of right now, I don't think it'll fall anywhere farther. Uh, well, I mean, depending on how things go, you know. Oh no, they're actually uh, sorry. They're they're one of the divisional teams, right? They're one of the top four teams, so their pick cannot drop below 25. So their pick is going to at least be the number 25th overall pick, but it could move up depending on how far they go into the playoffs. Uh, the Steelers are currently not in the playoffs and have the number, the 19 overall pick, but depending on how next week goes, they could move back into the playoffs and put them into the 20s. And then depending how far they would go, if they go farther in the playoffs, would then further determine where their pick is. Right now, we we'll pick at number five. We could drop to number six or possibly even go up to number two, depending on a lot of different things. So, well, that was about an hour long, and but there was a lot to say uh, for sure. And so, you know, I wanted to make sure to get it all out. And, uh, you know, like I said, I care about facts and data. So I'm not just making the claims that I make without having, you know, evidence to back it up and to prove it. And so I think I've done a pretty good job of that and so like i said there was a lot to talk about a lot of specific examples to give in this game and so uh you know it's a little bit over an hour but it is what it is so i'm gonna wrap it here i hope you guys enjoy my videos and my perspective if you do make sure you hit the subscribe button make sure you hit the like button make sure you hit the bell if you want to get the alerts share my channel my uh, videos with your friends and family leave your questions comments and concerns down in the comment section and of course as always make sure you follow me on twitter at dylan tartaro and with that i am out i'll see y'all soon fins up